just came in the mail. We just got this delivery inside this gorgeous Filofax box, which I most certainly will be keeping, resides my unicorn. I have been wanting what's inside this box for over a year now. And I just got it today because I happen to have the most awesome husband in the whole world. Inside this box is a planner cover that I will be in for my 2019 planner tour video. And I am very excited. For you, If you would like to see what's in here, you're going to have to wait and see my 2019 planner tour. But uh, happy Saturday. My awesome husband is uh, working on some of his projects. And I am going to work on uh, one of my most favorite projects in the whole world. And that means I'm going to work on my planner and work some more on my 2019 planner setup. Hello, this is Candy from eyes2jesus.blogspot.com doing the last weekend edition of Anti-Vlogmas with my handsome husband. Hello. And just, you know, to mention, yes, we have been going to church for all of the month of December. Uh, the current church we go to, they don't really do a big Christmas thing. Um, this was our first time going to this particular church so close to Christmas, being December 23rd. And uh, there were still no idols up, which was nice. Um, they uh, did sing uh, three Christmas songs. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the kids and everyone just kind of sat respectfully and I read my book. Yeah, one of them was Joy to the World, which they should be singing all year long, but since it was a Christmas-only song most of the time, my wife didn't even go ahead and sing it. Mm -hmm. I sang that one. I didn't sing the other two. And I didn't sing any of them. Uh, I, like I said, I read my book. I'm reading uh, Depth Typology, a fabulous book. You can see it linked on uh, my blog. Written by a fellow INTJ, however, uh, seems to be uh, an evolutionist, so you've got to be careful on that respect. Um, but yeah, other than that, church was pretty good. Um, some people who don't know us very well uh, wished us Merry Christmas, and I just told each of them, uh, you know, well, we don't celebrate it, but thanks anyways. So I think I was polite enough. And did I just say my wife rather than Candy? I mean, this is your audience, so I should probably say Candy. Ah. If it was my audience, I would say my wife. <laughs> hey, either way. <laughs> <laughs> my name is your wife. Oh, very nice, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get into this weekend edition um, anti vlogmas message. So I wanted to begin by um, looking over some scriptures, reviewing a few things. Uh, let's start with Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 through 14, which says, Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. But straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth to life, and few there be that find it. Christians are called to walk that straight and narrow path. Many finds the wide path. What does this tell us? This tells us that the majority of Christians are on the wide path to destruction. Remember, we've read scriptures where it says that the Lord wants us to worship Him in spirit and in truth. If you are not worshiping the Lord in truth, you may very well be on that wide path to destruction thinking that you're walking that narrow path. And that's why the Bible says in the New Testament, work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. That means examine yourself, examine your walk. Judge yourself, lest God needs to step in and judge you instead. Turns out that uh, uh, being narrow-minded is actually a good thing. Isn't it interesting that the world tries to teach us it's a bad thing? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And uh -huh. Christmas is definitely on that wide road. Oh, absolutely. Everyone's partaking in that one. Yeah, Christmas is completely wide road because it's an established fact. It's even in encyclopedias. Oxford Dictionary, the Roman Catholic Encyclopedia, it is a very established plain fact that the predecessor to Christmas was Saturnalia and that uh, Christmas is all out pagan. It was celebrated before Christ was born just under different names. So when a Christian claims that they're going to celebrate Christ's birthday on Baal's birthday, and Jesus was born in September, by the way, and I learned that from the Bible, then uh, that is completely wide road. Because it's not supposed to be about what you feel about it. It's supposed to be about what God feels about it. And God is explicitly clear in his scriptures that he does not want us 
committing spiritual adultery. And friends, I'm just going to say it straight up, a Christian knowing the true roots of Christmas but partaking in it anyways is a form of spiritual adultery against God. And you will be on the same wide road as the atheists. Many atheists have chosen that wide road to be on too. Mm-hmm. And then this leads us into another scripture I wanted to go over, and that is Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, which says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt <laughs> have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. I mean, if you're not salty, salt, what was salt? Salt adds flavor and it preserves. It's a preservative. Preservative. Yeah. I mean, if you have a whole bunch of salt and it's not salty and it's not going to do you any good, then at least you can throw it out, in today's modern respect, out on the ice so that people aren't slipping all over the place. But a Christian is supposed to be salty and we're supposed to be a preservative. Are you preserving the ways of the Lord? Are you seasoning, are you adding seasoning, which by the way is synonymous with being a light for the world, or have you lost your saltiness? Are you just blending in? Bland, with the, blend. Kind yeah, of. are you blandly blending in yeah. <laughs> with the world? Because a Christian is not only supposed to let their light shine, they're supposed to be salty. And different. Same Absolutely, thing. same thing. Yeah. yeah. So, and then <clears throat> when a Christian chooses not to partake in Christmas, that is an honor to God. All right, and then that brings me to another scripture I wanted to review. What is Christmas besides a pagan festivity, a pagan holy day? Christmas is built up from traditions of man, man-made traditions that, uh, if you trace it to the roots, originally were created to honor Baal, who was born on December 25th. So Colossians chapter 2, verse 8 says... Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of man, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Mm. Are you being spoiled and deceived by going after the tradition of man Christmas instead of after Christ? Why would you celebrate your Lord and Savior's birthday on his enemy's birthday and celebrate your Lord and Savior's birthday in a way that the enemy wants it celebrated? If you want to celebrate Jesus' birthday, do it in September, on or around September 29th when he was born, and don't do it any way like Christmas. But there's no, there's no call in the scriptures to celebrate his birthday. But if you want to have a birthday party for Jesus, do it in September. The Yule log, the mm -hmm. reindeer, that's all part of the Thor background, isn't it? Yeah, yes. Uh, Thor bad. used to uh, have reindeer. I think a couple of them were named like Cracker and Nasher. And uh, Thor used to ride in a sleigh with these reindeer. And you know what Thor used to shout? He used to shout, ho, ho, ho. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So even so, Santa Claus, he's not a made-up thing. He's actually a model after these false gods. And is, is Thor the Nordic word for Baal? I'm not sure. I'd have to look that up. I'd I don't have to know. See, yeah. Yeah. If, he's, if yeah. he was supposedly, he's supposedly the son. So, I mean, that's yeah. the son of the, of the yeah, he, he's a form king of, of Baal. Asgard, so. So. Yeah. All right, and then I wanted to uh, review uh, some key scripture that we're going to get into in more detail today. And that is Jeremiah chapter 2, chapter 10, verses 2 through 4, which says, Thus saith the Lord, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people, traditions of man, are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe, they deck it, decorate it, with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. Yes, there you go. And, I mean, um, okay, let me give you a quote from, from Jesus Christ as recorded in the Bible, chapter 15, book of John, uh, verse 18. If the world hate you, Ye know that it hated me before it hated you. 19. If the and if ye were of the world, the world would love its own. But because ye are not of the world, the world I, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. 
Well, what are the people, how are the people treated who um, aren't into this Christmas thing? Kind of treated like they're Scrooges, right? Bah humbug. And, yeah, and yeah, of course they're the established bah humbug. Yeah. It's actually correct. Look up the word humbug in the dictionary. Well, the more I learned about the, the truth of God from the Bible, uh, the more I learned what God's design is for man really is, the more I learned how much this world is aligned in opposition to God. What do you think would happen to somebody if they were in a crowded room and said, women were created to be a helpmeet for man? Wow, if the room was full of uh, non-Christians, I think it might get violent. But even in a room of Christians, I think I would get some opposition, even though this is exactly what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. After seeing how much the world was aligned against God, I used to wonder why Xmas, I'll call it Xmas, was so accepted by the world. I, as I became more knowledgeable uh, Christian, I found the answer to that question. And the answer is that Christmas is not of God. It is of the world. Even worse, Christmas is a deception designed to fool Christians. It may not have started out that way according to the official line from uh, Constantine, it was to try to draw people in, but I think he was dancing to Satan's tune. So, mm. I think they got a lot of us on that one. <clears throat> Have you wondered how it is that Candy can keep finding scriptures which go against celebrating Christmas? I mean, she seems to always have another one, you know? It's just like, man, let's open the Bible, and we've got another one here. Well, Pouring after other gods is one of the most common sins create, uh, committed by man. It's the thing we do wrong a lot, right? So God has had to admonish us for that over and over again, and it's been recorded in the Bible. So there's lots of scriptures that, uh, that go against this uh, traditions of men stuff, which is what Christmas is all about. Uh, how is it that people turn away from God again and again? What do people tell themselves to justify ungodly behavior? Whatever works. I mean, some people tell themselves that Christians who will not celebrate Christmas are guilty of the error called legalism. But I say to you that celebrating Christmas is legalism. What is legalism? Law is all about the words. Legalism is when somebody is more concerned with the words than the spirit of what God's words intended to convey. Finding loopholes is an act of legalism. And so I think we have a lot of Christians these days uh, who they, they, they just tell themselves, well, you know, God forgives me and, 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 and we've got all this freedom in Christ. And we do have a lot of freedom in Christ, but as, as Candy has mentioned before, we're, not, we're supposed to, as examples in light, we're supposed to abstain from any appearance of evil. And, well, we know that God thinks that includes setting up a Christmas tree, from what she just read. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, an example of Jesus Christ exposing some legalism would be the Sermon on the Mount, when Jesus Christ informed us that even to look at another person with lust in our heart is also the sin of adultery. The legalistic loophole is when people relegate God's word to be about the physical only, right, and leave the heart out of it. Uh, and in this case, saying to themselves, it's okay to look, but not to touch. I've heard that one myself from some of the guys I've worked with. The spirit of commandment, uh, the spirit of the commandment against adultery is to keep your heart true to the person you are committed to. No, legalism made the commandment against adultery only about outward physical expression of adultery. The spirit of the law included the heart, too. Of course, it would be ludicrous to say that you had not committed adultery if you had the, committed the physical act, but then claimed your heart remained true. So here we are with Christmas, when we're doing the physical acts of what God would consider spiritual harling, har, whoredom, and, but our hearts remaining true. I don't know. I think that uh, you're, you're, you're kind of playing a game there that you don't want to play. So, Jesus Christ criticized the Pharisees. And you're probably familiar, he, I mean, he called them, if you, a lot of people think the, of Jesus Christ as candy canes and lollipops all the time, but if you ever listen to him talking to the Pharisees, half the time he's berating them for something. And, uh, <clears throat> 
but one of the things he criticized them for was that they had the outward, uh, you know, adherence to the law. They were doing it, right? But their heart was far from God. So the Pharisees were committing legalism by, by conforming to the letter of the law, right? But not the spirit of the law. Those things that you would be doing because God told you to was supposed to draw you near to him in your heart. You were supposed to be thinking about God uh, <clears throat> and feeling close to him with that way. They weren't doing that. But re remember that Jesus said, unless your righteousness, your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, and they were doing all the outwardly stuff by the book, right? But unless you exceed their righteousness, you would in no way enter the kingdom of God. Well, what's one of the ways that the Bible tells us that we, that, that, that God looks at us as having done something righteous? Believing Him. As it, as it says in the New Testament, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Well, what did he tell us about the Christmas tree in the Old Testament? And we're not believing him? It's not righteousness. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, okay, so an example of, of how the, the Pharisees... Okay, well, one of the things that legalism is is that you add to the Word of God. And uh, the Pharisees... So, so much that it becomes ineffective. It becomes of no effect, as it says in the New Testament. And the Pharisees were in trouble with God. One of the reasons for adding to the Word of God was that they had made up so many rules for the Sabbath that it ended up being a great burden to the people. And that was not accomplishing what God's Word intended. I mean, uh, Jesus had to go ahead and say to them, when, once He was here, He said, look, God made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. That's how much yeah. that the, they had turned it around and turned it into where man was serving the Sabbath. <laughs> it wasn't something that was a, a nice break for man to be replenished by and to spend time with God. <clears throat> but Jesus called the Pharisees blind guides, indicating that they did not know how wrong they were. But that didn't get them out of trouble because they didn't know they were wrong. They were, they were wrong nevertheless and, <clears throat> and deserved to be admonished by God. And also, their, their righteous, the way they were living their lives was not good enough to get into heaven. Remember, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, you're not going to enter heaven. They weren't making it. So legalism is when you find a loophole in God's word or you add to God's words so that you can pretend you're not going against what he said. What do you think God meant for us to actually abstain from, physically and in our heart, when he said not to learn the way of the heathen? I think that physically we're not supposed to do the pagan rituals. They, it, God's word specifically explained what that looked like, and so we're not supposed to do that. Well, that means no Christmas trees. And spiritually, it means we're not supposed to even want to join the world in vain heathen traditions because this is spiritual harlotry. God commanded us to not learn the way of the heathen and then gave the very description of having a Christmas tree. What occurred at the cross which would make God start liking pagan rituals which he had specifically told us were in vain and that we're not supposed to learn? If you think it's okay to have a Christmas tree, what loophole do you think you have, or how have you added to God's words to make God's words of no effect in your life? This is legalism. It turns out that those who would accuse a person of legalism for not celebrating Christmas are the very people who are guilty of it. Yeah, yeah, that's how the logic works out. Yeah, and then in continuing on that, I wanted to uh, take today to go through the whole chapter of Jeremiah chapter 10. Because lest you think that I'm handling the Word of God deceitfully for those who are following in my 2 Corinthians uh, Bible mm -hmm. study, I want to show you that uh, Jeremiah chapter 10 is very much speaking out against what we would call today Christmas and specifically the Christmas tree. So please join me. Open up your King James Bible and uh, turn to Jeremiah chapter 10. And let's just get into this really quick. All right, so starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Hear ye the word which the Lord speaketh unto you, O house of Israel. Are you listening? 
Thus saith the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. We're not even supposed to learn their ways and their customs for their false gods. We're not even supposed to be interested in partaking in it. And be not dismayed at the signs of heaven. What do signs of heaven have to do with Christmas, since that's our topic? Well, if you look up Remphan in the Bible, you'll find that in the Bible. It talks about uh, the star of your god, Remphan. All right, and that's partially what this is referring to about the signs of heaven because the Christmas star was the star Remphan. And Remphan, if you don't know what Remphan is, that is Saturn. And what was the name of the predecessor to today's modern Christmas? It was Saturnalia. The Christmas star is Remphan, which was a which is Saturn, and Saturn is the uh satanic planet if you're going to get deeply into it and study mystery babylon all right so that would be part of don't be dismayed at the signs of heaven all right for the heathen are dismayed at them continue with verse three for the customs of the people are vain so we have a parallel don't learn the way of the heathen and the customs of the people are vain what is synonymous with customs of the people? It's traditions of man. Mm -hmm. And we're not supposed to partake as Christians. We're not supposed to partake in traditions of man that are tied into known pagan religious festivities. And that's why we are to say no to Christmas and Easter. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, the works of the workmen with the axe. They're going out to the forest with their axe, and they're picking an evergreen tree, and they're cutting it down. Verse 4, they deck it with silver and with gold. They're decorating it, silver and gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. It's being put in what we would call today a tree stand. They're setting it in the tree stand so it's not going to fall over. They are upright, this is in verse 5, they are upright as the palm tree, indicating that this tree... That's all they did was cut it down, take it out of the forest, decorate it, and put it in a tree stand. It's upright as a palm tree. It is up and down, indicating that they didn't put it in any other position. It's not laying down. It's not carved into any shape. It is being held in that stand upright like a palm tree. But speak not, okay, okay telling us this is considered an idol, because God says in his word over and over again, the idols can't even speak. They're not even alive. That's right, that's a reference back to it being an idol. Exactly. An idolatry. Yes, they must needs be born because they can't go. You have to carry it. It has no power of its own. Be not afraid for them, for they cannot do evil, neither also is it in them to do good. We have no reason to fear idols. I mean, yes, we read about, especially in the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament, that behind idols uh, and false gods are demons and devils. But if you are a child of God, you don't have to fear the demons behind these idols. And well, certainly you don't need to fear the idol itself. Because if you're a child of God, you have God's very spirit dwelling within you. It speaks not, it, the, the idol itself is dead. And uh, that's why a lot of times the Bible refers to God as the true and living God. Yes. Okay, continue with verse 6. For as much as there is none like unto thee, O Lord, thou art great, and thy name is great in might. Who would not fear thee, O king of nations? For to thee, thee doth it appertain. For as much as among all the wise men of the nations, and in all their kingdoms, there is none like unto thee. No idol, no idol can compare to the one true God. Now starting in verse 8, this is a different paragraph. Some Bibles mark this as a different paragraph or a different subject heading, and some make the mistake and do not. So verse 8, next paragraph. But they are altogether brutish and foolish. Who is they? This is referring back to the heathen, the pagans. They are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. What's the stock? It's going to describe the stock. Now it's going into a different type of tree idol. See, this chapter talks about two different types of tree idols. All right, verses 1 through 7 talks about the tree idol where you leave the tree in its natural state. You just cut it down, put it in a stand, and decorate it. And now it's going to talk about fashioning the stock, and that can be the trunk or 
the main stem of the tree, fashioning it into an idol. Carved idol. Carved idol, yes. Yeah. So now it's going to get into a graven idol. All right. So, verse 8 again, but they are altogether brutish and foolish. The stock is a doctrine of vanities. Silver spread into plates is brought from Tarshish and gold from Uphaz. The work of the workmen and the hands of the founder, blue and purple is their clothing. They are all work of cunning men. So notice the tree idol uh, in verses 1 through 7. It says, the work of the workmen with the axe, because they are just cutting the tree down. But now, starting in verse 8, now it's talking about another idol made from a tree, and this one is a graven image made from a tree, and that this one is a work of the workmen and the hands of the founder, because they are carving the tree into a specific shape, and then they are putting metal plates over it that they're they making. They could be doing the gold leaf. Thing, where you, yeah. you make the gold very thin and then you spread it over the wood and uh, the gold is so soft it'll kind of go into the wood and you can make it very shiny. Yeah, yeah. All right, verse 10 continuing. But the Lord is the true God. He is a living God and an everlasting king. At his wrath the earth shall tremble and the nation shall not be able to abide his indignation. Thus shall ye say unto them, The gods, lowercase g, that have not made the heavens and the earth, even they shall perish from the earth and from under these heavens. These false gods, Baal and Ashtoreth, where all this originated from, Nimrod, they're going to come to naught. Also, uh, notice how we're supposed to fear the one true and living God. Mm -hmm. And in the New Testament, Jesus specifically says, and you can go back to this if you're trying to justify doing Christmas because your family wants you to uh, and they wouldn't like it if you didn't you would be afraid they would be looking down on you and everything Jesus says do not fear those fear man who can even kill the body but do nothing to the soul fear God in heaven who can cast your soul into hell yes yes all right continue with verse 12 he, God, hath made the earth by his power. He hath established the world by his wisdom, and hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he causeth the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth. He maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Verse 14. Every man is brutish in his knowledge. Every founder, because right now, remember, we're in the section of creating the idol. It's now a founder, working not... Working with metal. Yeah, you're working with metal. Every founder is confounded by the graven image, for his molten images is falsehood, and there is no breath in them. They are vanity, and the work of errors. In the time of their visitation, they shall perish. The portion of Jacob is not like them, for he is a former of all things, and Israel is the rod of his inheritance. The Lord of hosts is his name. And if you are a child of God, you have inherited the Lord of hosts. And as a child of God, don't act like you're a child of the world. Don't act like a worshiper of Nimrod, Baal, Ashtoreth. All right, so what happens to these people who are partaking of these festivities who are learning the ways of the heathen and what happens to these people whether it be a graven image that we just read a description of uh, verses 8 through 16 or whether it be a Christmas tree idol like we read a description of from verses 1 through 7 well verse 17 and 18 says gather up thy wares out of the land O inhabitants of the fortress for thus saith the Lord Behold, I will sling out the inhabitants of the land at this once, and will distress them, and they may find it so. Okay, so there we have what can happen to the heathen who are doing these practices. They receive judgment too, because they had plenty of opportunities to receive the one true God. Alright, but what does God think of Christmas? What does he think of Christians who are partaking in Christmas? It's going to be what he thought of the Israelites partaking in the ways of the heathen and the ancient Christmas, because God never changes. So what does God think about Christians who partake in Christmas? Let's find out. Let's go to verse 19. Mm -hmm. Woe is me for my hurt. 
You are hurting the Lord and causing Him woe when you say that you love and follow Him, but you are partaking in these pagan Christmas festivities. My wound is grievous, but I said, truly this is a grief and I must bear it. My tabernacle is spoiled, the tabernacle of the Lord. For example, places of worship where Christians are gathered. Now they have idols up this time of year, pagan idols against Jeremiah verses 1 through 7 in this chapter 10. The Christmas trees, the wreaths, the advent candles, etc. Or just in your very home having up these idols. And the tabernacle of His Holy Spirit indwelling believers. When the believer is soiling that tabernacle by, uh, by partaking in these pagan festivities. Their spirit, their Christmas. conscience. Yeah, mm -hmm. the tabernacle. Yeah, so verse 20, My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not... People, so many people who claim to be Christians seem to be Christians most of the year, except come spring and winter solstice, suddenly they join the pagans. There's not much difference. Even most of the uh, Christian Christmas songs uh, can be sang unto Baal uh, on behalf of Baal's birthday, a lot of them can be. Remember, Baal was born December 25th. <laughs> we have no, we shouldn't be singing these Christmas songs. Yes, yeah, singing about joy to the world anywhere near the, the, the 25th of Christmas because of a birth, that's mm -hmm. not good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, where did it go? So, verse 20, My tabernacle is spoiled, and all my cords are broken. My children are gone forth of me, and they are not. There is none to stretch forth my tent anymore and to set up my curtains. Is there any righteous? Is there anybody left? There is a remnant. Are you part of that remnant? Are you on that narrow road that leads to salvation? Or are you happily skippy-dippy going along the wide path to destruction with most other professing Christians? Verse 21. This is especially prophetic for today. For the pastors, it says pastors here, for the pastors are become brutish and have not sought the Lord. They're helping to lead people on this wide road, this wide path to destruction, if they are allowing these idols to be put up in their church, and if they are preaching pro-Christmas, and they are urging and celebrating Christmas. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. And I have seen churches broken up over Christmas, by the way. Yeah, there was one that we were attending that started trying to do the Advent candle magic, and mm -hmm. that ended up breaking the whole church up. It's gone now. That church is completely gone now. It's all gone. They never partook in Christmas before then, and they decided this one year that they were going to do Christmas and Advent, and yeah, that church is now gone. They received swift judgment. All right, and then uh, ver speaking of judgment, here is judgment in verse 22. Behold, the noise of the brute is come, and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. Why was the cities of Judah being made desolate here? Because they didn't judge themselves, so ju God had to judge them. Judge in yourself. Judge yourself. Come out of Christmas before God's judgment comes on you instead, because it's coming. Yes, if you've got family members... If you are in, the, in a position of spiritual um, uh, leadership in your family and you are partaking of Christmas and you know better, I mean, I think some of the Christ Christians who don't know any better, especially if they're new Christians, they're probably going to pass by God. But mm -hmm. if you know better and you're, and you're partaking of Christmas, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if your children um, or are, are suffering some kind of, or, or even your mate is suffering some kind of physical problems, some, some bad health issues. Mm -hmm. Or you might see some other kind of judgment. Whatever you think is a problem for you these days that, that could be God bringing judgment out upon you. When I start having trouble in life, first question you want to ask, and the question I, I should, if I, I'm remiss if I don't ask, is, God, what are you trying to show me here? Mm -hmm. Because chances are, you know, we all miss something. Um, yeah, a lot of times you know. people will attribute these tribulations to the enemy, when in fact it's not the enemy, it's God trying to get their attention. 
What yeah. do you think the whole seven-year tribulation is going to be about? That's not the enemy. That's God trying to get people's attention. Yes, the seven-year tribulations, it says time and again, God then does this next great judgment upon the people, and still they would not repent. It mm -hmm. talks about how they still won't. God's trying to bring them in, and they just keep trying to resist. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So maybe now you have become convicted in the Holy Spirit, and maybe now you, Christian, are ready to come out of Christmas. Maybe even today, December 23rd, you are making the decision that you're coming out of Christmas now, you're canceling your plans, you're getting rid of the tree idol. Then th this chapter offers a prayer for you to pray in coming out of Christmas. Mm. And that prayer is in verses 23 and 24, which says... O oh Lord, I know that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. O oh Lord, correct me, but with judgment, not in thine anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. And then pray in your own words. Basically, you are acknowledging God. You are apologizing to Him for your spiritual adultery. You are repenting of that sin. And you are truly committing your life to Him as Him, as your master and owner, that you do sincerely, honestly, not only want to live your life for God, but that you're going to do it. See, in psychology, especially um, like uh, Jungian uh, MBTI psychology, uh, there's a couple of um, terms. There's ego and persona. Right? Ego is who the person thinks that they are. Persona is the mask they wear or who they project themselves to be outwardly. Uh, now, a lot of people, their ego and persona are fairly similar. Uh, for example, my ego and persona are extremely close. Uh, how my persona may differ from my ego is in public, I often can appear way more introverted than I actually am. Uh, and that's some of the biggest differences. But you need to look out that you don't fall into an ego-persona dichotomy. Maybe you're ready to come out of Christmas and you want to do it right now. So your ego, your inner you, has come out of Christmas. But unless this is reflected in your persona, your outward you and your actual actions, unless the ego and the persona match up, you have not come out of Christmas yet. Um, I saw a family once on YouTube that were given a testimony of how they came out of Christmas. Yet, as I was watching the video, they went on to describe that how they came out of Christmas was they decide they're not celebrating it, they're not buying gifts for anyone, but they still go to family's house for Christmas every year and they still receive an unwrapped gifts for everyone. They just don't bring any gifts. That is a mismatch between their ego and their persona. Their ego, their inner selves, they think they're not celebrating Christmas, but their persona, how they're reacting outwardly, is not matching. They are appearing to not only be celebrating Christmas, but to be freeloaders. They're taking all the gifts and all the food, and they're not giving yeah. any back out. So you need to make sure you don't have a mismatch between yeah. ego and persona. Yes, I... Um one of the things I learned in studying this to, in the last 24 hours even was I got a clear distinction that when God tells you to do something, He's expecting you to do it both outwardly and inwardly. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, uh, people think that they can go ahead and do Christmas, but inwardly they're worshiping God. Well, you know, like, like the adultery example. You know, if you outwardly do adultery, but inwardly you are staying true to your mate, you know that's not going to fly with God. Yeah. It's just not going to, you know, you're going to stand in front of him and give him that. Uh, well, this is a spiritual version of adultery, this whole Christmas thing that we're talking mm -hmm. about. And to actually outwardly do it, but say to yourself, oh, but I'm not making it mean whatever the pagans made it mean. I'm making it mean this. We have to obey God in both deed and and spirit. And remember, heart. it's not what you make it mean, it's what God makes it mean. And we know what God makes it mean, we just read about it. There's some judgment there. Yeah, and then in wrapping up this chapter, uh, the last verse then talks about judgment to those heathen, those people of the land who are not children of God and who are partaking in this worship of the false gods instead of seeking the one true God. So verse 25 says, 
Pour out thy fury upon the heathen that know thee not, and upon the families that call not on thy name. For they have eaten up Jacob, and devoured him, and consumed him, and have made his habitation desolate. So, that's why we're not supposed to follow the ways of the heathen, because they will be enticing. They will tempt you if you allow yourself to be tempted. Next thing you know, your ego isn't partaking, but your persona is. Yes, this year, I mean, how much of a witness would that be to those around you if you took all the decorations down right now, tonight? What a blessing. Mm -hmm. What kind of blessings would you get from God for doing that? Mm -hmm. And don't think that you're alone in this. I have been contacted by multiple people privately who are coming out of Christmas and canceling their plans right now. You can join them. Mm. So what if you make your family mad? Maybe they won't understand, but you let your light shine. You continue being true to God and they will see your conversation in the world as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And that could eventually make a massive difference to their life. Be in this for the long haul, not just the short run. We want the long-term rewards. Amen. So that concludes today's study. I hope it blessed you and helped you in some way. And I hope that uh, if you haven't already, join the movement and come out of Christmas. It's very freeing. Have a blessed day. Uh, Hello, this is Candy from Good Eyes. Wait, 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 <laughs> Uh, messing with my eyebrows to try to get my face <laughs> in the correct position. So. All right, everybody do your facial exercises. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, now I'm blushing, so. <sighs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you. <laughs> <laughs>